spell out exactly where you and Chief Saunders do not see eye to eye on the street checks? The question is that Police Chief Mark Saunders has said that he and the police have always been against arbitrary stopping of civilians. And so what is the difference between his position and ours? And I would answer that by saying that um, Chief Saunders says that, but what his officers actually do day to day on the street is quite different. No one in their right mind in Canada in the 21st century would say that they are for the arbitrary stopping and documenting of civilians. So I don't expect Mark Saunders, the chief of police, to say that that's what he supports. But why is it that the behavior of officers on the ground is so dramatically different from the stated practice from the chief? So That's what we don't understand. So if the policy already says they're not allowed to do arbitrary talk, stops, then how do you think that changing, changing some of these regulations would stop officers who are already apparently breaking the rules? Howard, Howard, I think you can speak to this one. Yeah. But there, I don't know what policy you're referring to. Uh, to my knowledge, there is no such policy. In fact, when Chief Saunders was asked at the beginning of the summer when the new Toronto Board proposal came through, when you say you suspended carding, Chief, what do you mean? And you can look up in the transcript his answer. We stopped filling out the cards. So it's actually far worse because the Toronto Star or others can no longer track how much of this carding is going on. But don't fool yourself the thinking that none of this goes on. I think it's probably worse now than it was last May or April. But a lot of police officers are actually saying that because uh, people are not being carded as they were before, this is according to police, they're being told by their police informants that there's more people carrying guns on the streets now because they know that they won't be stopped by police just for a conversation. No. Sorry if I may. Just to repeat for those who can't hear the question, the question was around whether or not the streets have become more unsafe since the police suspended the practice of carding. They, they claim suspended. The police have yet to come forward with information as to why they need to stop people arbitrarily, why this is going on. There is very little data produced, uh, and certainly almost none produced voluntarily by police services across the country and certainly across the province about the numbers of people who are being stopped, why they're being stopped in the circumstances. And so the onus has to be on the police to demonstrate which circumstances are legitimate and which are not. And what we're saying here is that if we leave language broad, if we just say end carding, end arbitrary stops, and there are no specific guidance and details provided, then we are left with the interpretation of police officers who unfortunately have a long-standing tradition and culture of stopping somebody because they have a hunch or a suspicion or because something doesn't look right. And what that means in reality is that young black men, young racialized people, young indigenous people, homeless, uh, and so forth are being stopped for no reason and having interactions that go from already a violation of their fundamental rights, sometimes they go from there to worse. And so what we are calling for is very specific guidance, very specific restrictions on police activity, and in addition to that, robust accountability measures. And those should be of assistance, not just to the individuals who are being stopped and the communities that are being targeted. Robust accountability measures should be helpful to police as well, because they will have the opportunity to have data that they can present and say, look, our service, our numbers are down, where we conduct stops, it's because there was a reasonable suspicion, that is the constitutional standard, there was a reasonable suspicion that this person was connected to a crime and we needed to detain them. That is permitted, that is lawful, legitimate, and constitutional policing. And if that's what their data is showing, we won't, we won't have anything to say about it. But in the absence of data, we can't do anything about it, and that's why there are a number of accountability measures that are needed at that time. Just ask others with questions just to let us know who you are from the media before you ask your question. Hi, Jessica, I'm Jessica with Metro. I've got a question about how do you think the regulations can be tightened so that police officers can't stop people who sort of fit the description as an excuse versus are looking for an actual suspect in the use of crime and they think it might be this person? How can that be done? The question is how can police stop people who, you want to speak to that right now? How can police stop people who are actually 
suspects, I would say, criminal suspects as part of an investigation rather than just stopping people at random? Yeah. So who put a tag description as an excuse for stopping them? The car versus our... So how, right, how to stop, you fit the description of, and that's why I'm stopping you, versus something more concrete. I think really all we're asking police to do is do good police work, which means having descriptions that are better than young black men. And I think where this really hit home for me is a colleague of mine said, you know, if they were in Rosedale and the, su and the um, suspect description was young white man, would that be licensed to knock on doors and stop every young man, white man in that neighborhood? I think most people would see that that would be inappropriate and casting the net much too wide. But yet in many other communities where you know, the predominance of people are not white. Um, we see that very description resulting in very broad um, investigative reach. And so we're saying that, you know, police should have to do the same thing that they would do in Rosedale, which is figure out how is it, how, who are you looking for? What are the details of the offense? You know, what is the build, the, you know, all of the things you see on descriptions when we're talking about um, a white suspect. There, there was, oh, sorry. Just to follow up on that, Tamara Cherry with CTV. Um, there was a case recently in York Region, in Newmarket, with a string of sexual assaults where it was sort of a broad suspect description of a young white man, and police were doing exactly that. They were asking anybody who knows somebody that matches this fairly broad description in the neighborhood to call them. So is that any different than if it was a young black man who was wanted in the sexual assault? Well, first of all, I don't, I'm not going to speak to the particular case because I'm not uh, familiar with it. But I think we're, we oppose racialized policing in all aspects. So, you know, obviously we, our, our position is this predominantly affects racialized communities. But if you are using race as one of the only factors in a suspect des description, that is racialized policing. So, you know, this is something that we care about regardless of the color of the person's skin. It's just that our um, sort of, this community group is recognizing that policing is often disproportionately impacts racialized communities. And, and to speak to your point, uh, the police asking for information from the public about a specific race is different than the police actually stopping and targeting people and harassing them. And we have to acknowledge that the police interactions with the African Canadian community or indigenous community play out much different than when they interact with the Caucasian community. And that is part of the underlying problem of policing in this city and in this province and the regulations. And to um, Jessica, who asked the other question, um, the regulations currently have a fix for the, the vague suspect descriptions. However, the problem is the regulations have so many exemptions to that fix that they would probably never be applied. So in particular, um, any, any police officer that stops someone for a vague reason must articulate why that person fits their, their description or what is particular about that person that they have to investigate. But then it's exempted by if the police officer believes that that person may have knowledge of a crime or if the police officer, there, there's too many exemptions to make that qualification um, an effective one. And this is what we're calling on. We're calling on the closing of the gaps of those regulations to ensure that the scope is widened, because right now it is way too narrow. Mr. Singh, from CBC, I uh, just a uh, question about something that you mentioned uh, when you were speaking earlier about working with people. Because me being a black person in the city, I'm regularly targeted while driving, and I'm stopped for no traffic offense, just a general investigation. At those times that I've been stopped, I was unaware that officers were writing descriptions about me and putting them in the database. Um, there is nothing in the regulations that prevents an officer from writing down information and storing it when it serves no public safety purpose. And I should be notified, and any subject of a, of a carding or street check should be notified if information is going to be taken, and the notification of the receipt would be effective, whereas I would receive that receipt. However, the draft regulations provide an exemption for when you're statutorily obliged to provide information, such as when you're driving. Because you're required to provide ID when you're driving, the regulations say that they do 
not apply in those circumstances. So I would have no recourse, I would have no ability to demand a receipt, I would not be informed that I do not have to answer questions. And that is the majority of my stops have been in traffic stops, and they've had no public safety purpose, and they would not be stopped uh, under the current regulations. And the one where you would have been? The one where I would have been, um, the officer actually pulled out his pad, and I knew he was going to ask me for my, for my information because I was assisting some other people that were being stopped by police. And when he asked me for the information, I complied because I knew that if I didn't, the situation may escalate. With these regulations, if they applied in all circumstances, I could say to the officer, I, I know that I'm not under criminal investigation, therefore I choose not to give you any information. When he goes from the truck stop, when the criticism is I say talking to someone and approaching someone with the intent of interrogating them is different than speaking to someone with the intent of being friendly and, and creating a contact. Unfortunately, the majority of police interactions with members of the community, specifically African, Canadian, and Indigenous, there is already a pretext of criminal behavior assumption on behalf of the police. So when the questions are asked of the person, they're very imposing, intimidating, and limit the type of responses that the individual can give. Um, I'm sure that if the police approach was totally different, there would see more cooperation between the public and the conversations. But what they are doing is they are targeting, targeting the community and harassing in a way that is not acceptable. I would like to add to that that some of the frustration that we all feel around this regulation and around the response to our call to end carding is the lack of specifics. So, Wendy, to your question about the police suggesting that they won't be able to do their jobs once this regulation gets put into place, what specifically will the police not be able to do that they need to do in order to prosecute crime? That's the question that they need to specifically address. We've been very specific here in giving examples of how we will not be protected under the new regulations. But I want to add to this idea, you know, that there's going to be a community safety crisis if we regulate carding. There is already a crisis, and it's with what's happening in our communities every day, with us being unfairly targeted. That is the crisis that we are facing. And it's actually incredibly irresponsible for the police leadership to suggest that by us demanding our charter rights be enforced, that we are endangering public safety. That is an extremely irresponsible position for the police to take, but we've heard them out there saying that what we on this platform here are doing is actually making our city less safe. And the opposite is true. We are standing up for community safety. We are standing up for the notion that lack of trust between police and community necessarily makes community more unsafe. We are not here to be policed. We are here to work in partnership with our police, and we cannot do that unless they follow the law. In, in terms of the specifics, sorry, um, one thing the police would say specifically they can do is that, that carding provides the intelligence needed for search warrants that are necessary in arrest. There's been multiple homicide investigations where they say that, well, no, but there are specific examples that they've given. So when you're saying you need to hear specifics, if they say that it was this specific association that we had from a street check that provided the basis for the warrant that led to the arrest. Let, yeah, let me, so this is a question about the police saying that there are specific incidents, instances in which carding has solved crimes. Uh, you cannot cast a net on millions of people in the province of Ontario and say we're going to watch all of you, we're going to document all of you, because five or six times we're going to be able to solve a crime. That is a disproportionate use of force by the police. Let me add to that with my own personal experiences, because many of you know I have also been stopped and questioned by the police dozens of times. What useful information did the police get by stopping me on Bathurst Street when I was walking a bicycle, informing me that you cannot ride a bicycle on the sidewalk, 
which I wasn't doing, and then demanding my personal identification, which went into the database. They kept that information, even though I was not breaking any law, and there was no problem. Why are the police fighting to be able to keep that information? Of what material value is that information to the police? If they want to come and talk to someone in community, and they realize nothing is up, at, what, at that point, what value is that information for them? This is terrifying to us that the police are actually telling us we need to watch everyone, we need to document everyone, just in case someone is doing something. That is not proportion. That's not how the legal system is supposed to work in this country. And what did you want to add to that? Sorry. I agree with Desmond generally that over-policing, it's not surprising that over-policing would lead to crime solved. Um, that doesn't mean it's not discriminatory or based on arbitrary interactions. And second of all, I think your point gets at what we're calling for is better data collection. Right now, what we're hearing is essentially anecdotal, um, I guess, evidence from the police, but it's not hard data that has any sort of, uh, we can't rely on a few anecdotes to suggest that this practice um, is effective. And one of the key asks we have is that data be collected so that we can understand when these kinds of stops actually lead to um, real arrests and, uh, and convictions. Just, uh, just on the issue of crime solving, if, if that's your major concern, why aren't you in favor of people, police officers, going into person's homes without search warrants? feeding confessions out of people, or eavesdropping on private conversations, whether by telephone or otherwise. All of those would help solve some crimes. But it's a cost-benefit thing, and the Charter of Rights applies to those types of behavior, as it does to party. The second thing about trust is this. In this province, there are dozens of serious crimes committed, witnessed literally in some cases by hundreds of people. None of those people come forward. Retribution may be one reason, fear of retribution one, but the major one, in my view, is a lack of trust. And if you can create a trust by getting rid of carding, you'll find more and more people are prepared to assist the police. We all want to be safe in our communities. None of us are in favor of having rent. Fine. But you've got to balance the two and come to a just conclusion. Sophia Singh's charter challenge against police carding. Um, the charter challenge is still in the application stage because of the new announcement, new developments over the past months. Um, a lot of the legal support and myself have been working diligently on trying to ensure the regulations are sufficient. Um, we will continue with it once this has passed, but it, it is still in the application stage. There's one more thing I'd like to add if there are no more questions, because this is a provincial regulation that we're talking about. So I'd like to cite an example from Hamilton to close. Uh, this is very, very important. A CBC journalist did a freedom of information request recently in Hamilton, Ontario. And that journalist wanted to know, in recent years, who had been stopped three or more times by their own police. She wanted to know the identities of those individuals in Hamilton. That freedom of information request was processed. It revealed that in Hamilton, Ontario, 94% of the individuals who were stopped three or more times in a year by their police were black or indigenous or from another racialized group. Let me repeat that. 94% of the people who were stopped three or more times in a year by their own police in Hamilton, Ontario, were black or indigenous or from another racialized group. When we ask for the statistics, when we ask for the specific information on who is being stopped, this is what happens time and time again, whether it is in Ottawa, whether it is in uh, Peel region, whether it's here in Toronto or in Hamilton, we find disproportionate stops among black and indigenous and other racialized groups. That's the record. That's why we're all here talking today. And when we ask for specifics, there is no justification in my mind, and I think I speak for many people on this stage, 
to say that that is ever fair. That there could be a fair reason why in Hamilton 94% of those multiply stopped were racialized people. We know that the bias that exists in policing is being played out on the street every day. That bias, not just with the police, but in our larger society. And so we're fighting a fight here against anti-racism and against police brutality, as well as trying to demand justice for better regulations in this, in, in this carding process. Anything further? Thank you very much, everyone, for coming this morning.